it's nice to be back in Oxford. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, entanglement of vertebral channels. Um, so the talk's based on the paper of the same name, which is which is on the archive uh, now. Um, oh, am I going backwards or forwards? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so, 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 yeah, the basic setup for quantum information theory, uh, systems of finite dimensional C-star algebras, and channels are completely positive, trace-preserving uh, linear maps. Uh, but some notation, we'll, we'll write B of, B of H for the C-star algebra of operators on a finite dimensional Hilbert space H, and we'll write... Uh, n for the n-dimensional commutative C-star algebra. Uh, and the nice thing about channels is that kind of ev everything is a channel um, in the sense that uh, like, so, so the things that are normally called quantum channels, I guess, would be uh, channels between matrix algebras. But uh, n outcome PV P of Vms uh, uh, channels from a matrix algebra to an n-dimensional commutative C-star algebra, states are channels from the uh, complex numbers to a matrix algebra. Stochastic channels are channels between um, commutative C star algebras uh, and uh, sort of general quantum operations, you know, where you've got some classical inputs, some classical outputs, and some quantum inputs and quantum outputs. The channels between sort of general uh, finite dimensional C star algebras. So it's quite a nice sort of general formalism. Um, uh, oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. Great, yeah. So so uh, starting point is kind of reversible and invertible channels. So, so reversible and invertible channels are kind of what you'd expect. So uh, we say that a channel is is reversible if there's a sort of a left inverse in the sense that there's a there's a tra channel from A to B and you need a channel from B to A so that uh, F followed by G is the identity on A uh, and and so that's 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 a reversible channel we call G the left inverse of F so it's kind of a very very obvious definition uh, and if additionally uh, G followed by F is the identity on B uh, we say that the channel F is invertible and we say that G is the inverse of F. And there's some obvious observations, you know, that uh, if F is reversible, then the dimension of, of, of A is going to be less than the dimension of B because it's a linear map, right? So, so if, 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 if it's a reversible linear map, then the dimensions must be, one dimension must be less than the other. And if it's invertible, then the dimensions are equal. So, so we're going to define a, de a generalization of reversibility and invertibility of a channel, which takes account of uh, some entanglement. Um, Right, so 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 let uh, take take some state of of of, of two uh, two Hilbert spaces, uh, and and then let M be a channel of type uh, A tensor uh, B of H one to B, uh, and we say that M is entanglement reversible with respect to this state if there's a channel N from uh, B tensor B H two to A, which satisfies the following equation. So so you should read these diagrams from bottom to top. So the idea is you kind of uh, you have this state W, and then M is performed. And then n is performed, and you get the identity. So it's a generalization of reversibility, and it's a genuine generalization in the sense that if if these Hilbert spaces here are one-dimensional, then W is trivial, and you just get the normal definition of reversibility back. Um, so th so it's, it's a generalization of, of reversibility, and we say we say that n is an entanglement left inverse for m uh, with respect to the state W, because obviously it, the state W matters here. Um, Right, so that's, that's entanglement reversibility, and then we can define entanglement invertibility. So um, uh, the idea is we, we want to, uh, so, so let, let M be kind of as above, and let N be an entanglement left inverse, so, so M followed by N is the identity, uh, and we want the kind of left inverse equation, so we're going to need to use the swap here, because obviously the types need to match up. But the, the idea is basically the same, now you do N before M, uh, and you get the identity on, on B. Uh, so this is obviously a generalization of, um, of, of, of actual, uh, of, of ordinary invertibility in the sense that, again, if these Hilbert spaces are one-dimensional, uh, you get the normal definition of invertibility back. Uh, so, so yeah, we say that we say, if this equation holds, we say that ends an entanglement inverse uh, for M with respect to W. So it's quite, it's quite a kind of uh, natural definition of, natural generalization of, 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 of reversibility and invertibility. Uh, and so, so let's see some examples. So, so quantum teleportation schemes are examples of entanglement reversible channels. So, so if you let A, if you let this, this C star algebra A be the, uh, a matrix algebra and B be um, uh, a commutative C star algebra, uh, but then an entanglement reversible channel from A to B is precisely a quantum teleportation scheme. So operationally, if we see, if we see what's going on here, Alice and Bob are going to share this bipartite quantum state W. Yeah, and Alice wants to transmit the state of her quantum system BK to Bob. Uh, and she's going to perform a P of e M, M on, on, her, uh, Hil on her system and her half of the entangled state. And she's going to get, so it's P of e M because it goes to a classical system. 
uh, so, 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 so going back here, uh, this M is going to go from quantum times quantum to classical, so it's a P of the M. And then Bob's going to take that information, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna use it to perform sort of, sort of an operation on his, uh, his half of the entangled state, and he's going to get this original quantum state goes through. So, so teleportation is, is, is an entanglement reversible channel. Um, uh, same, thing with, same thing with dense coding. So, so dense coding is the other way around, right? So, so, so you want to transmit some classical information using quantum communication. So if, uh, if A, is a com now a commuted, uh, A is now a commutative uh, C star algebra, the, then the idea is Alice has some classical information she wants to send. She's going to uh, take in her half the entangled state. She's going to do something to it controlled with this classical information. She's going to get some quantum information, which she's going to send over to Bob. Bob's going to do some, like, uh, some, some uh, uh, POVM to get the classical information out. Um, so, 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 um, so, so, yeah, dense coding is, is another example of an entanglement reversible channel, this time from a uh, commutative to a uh, quantum uh, C-star algebra. Um, yeah, so, so you've got teleportation, dense coding. There are more examples. So, so as we've said already, like any ordinary reversible invertible channel is an entanglement invertible or entanglement reversible channel. You just set the uh, auxiliary Hubbard spaces after mention one. Um, but but you, you also have kind of more general kind of genuine entanglement reversible and entanglement invertible channels. So, so uh, there's this, uh, there's these, uh, so from classical to classical, so, so that, that this channel will go from like classical information, tensor, um, Hilbert space to classical information. So, so you have these non-local games where you've got two players uh, that can't communicate, they share some entanglement, uh, and they need to, they receive some classical information from like the referee and they need to send some classical information back. And in order to kind of decide what classical information they'll send back, they'll do a measurement on a, on a uh, shared entangled state. So, um, so, so yeah, this has the right type, yeah? Cause, cause you get some classical information, you have the H1 and then you get some classical information out. So, so it turns out that the, in, that these uh, strategies for these, this graph isomorphism game here are precisely kind of entanglement and vertical channels. So that, that's, that's, that's another example. Um, in time with reversible channels between, between matrix algebras, I, I don't know. Um, so, so, so it seems like quite a natural definition, but, but I, I, I don't have any examples. And, and, and these general ones as well, uh, I don't have any examples. So, so if, uh, if anyone knows any sort of, uh, knows, knows anything that looks like an entanglement reversible, entanglement reversible channel, I'd be interested to hear about it. Um, right, yeah, so, so, so classifying these things, uh, there's this kind of paper from Werner from 2001, um, where he, he classifies tight teleportation dense coding schemes, which we've already seen uh, entanglement reversible channels, right, from, from BK to N and N to BK, uh, respectively. Uh, and uh, uh, tightness is a dimensional restriction, so, so, so the, uh, uh, basically the Hilbert space Alice wants to send has dimension D, and so do the uh, Hilbert spaces of the entangled state. Uh, and uh, the, the classical information uh, has uh, D squared uh, possible values. Um, so in this case, Werner had this result that says um, for entanglement reversibility, you need you need a, a maximally entangled pure state, uh, and uh, any entanglement reversible channel is furthermore entanglement invertible. And here you get a bijection between teleportation and dense coding schemes, right? Because because like classical to quantum is teleportation, quantum to classical is dense coding. So so if it's entanglement invertible, like is entanglement reversible the other way too? Um, uh, and also, uh, uh, any tight teleportation dense coding scheme is precisely specified by the data of a unitary error basis. So this is a basis of unitary operators orthogonal under the trace inner product. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Werner had this classification. Uh, so our result is uh, like a, a generalization of Werner's classification to um, entanglement vertical, reversible and entanglement vertical channels between arbitrary C star algebras without any dimensional restriction. Um, yeah, so, 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 so we answer this question, which is if you have a channel A from a times bh1 to b, and a state of bh1 times bh2, when is the channel entanglement reversible, entanglement invertible with respect to, to w? So that's the question we're going we're gonna to answer. Um, let's check, uh, check how time's going. Uh, so, so how, how much time have we used? Yeah, six Great, thanks. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, that's about right. Uh, okay, so, so um, in order to, so, so, so basically, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to have time to present the proof, but, but I am going to have time to kind of present the statement of the results. So, so um, in, order to, in order to present the result, I'll need to kind of introduce uh, this, this sort of Steinspring's theorem, but it may not be Steinspring's theorem. As, it, it is Steinspring's theorem, but it may not be as you've seen it before. So, so, so I sort of need to, um, to introduce it uh, uh, in this kind of setting. 
Uh, so so uh, we use this kind of shaded graphical calculus for index families of linear maps, which was developed in this uh, in these works. So there's this book by uh, Chris Horner and Jamie Vickery, and there's a paper by uh, David Reuter and Jamie Vickery, uh, by Unity Constructions in Quantum Information, where they sort of develop this, this graphical calculus. Um, the version we use is like, it, it has some more stuff in it, uh, so, so to do with the C star structure and, and, and duality and things like that. So, um, uh, I, I mean, formally it's the graphical calculus of the C star two category, but you can understand it without any knowledge of category theory and we give a full introduction to the paper. So, so right now I'm just gonna introduce the parts we need in order to state the result. Um, okay, so, so, so just to review the untraded calculus, which I'm sure most people are sort of familiar with, um, so, so Hilbert spaces correspond to wires, linear maps correspond to boxes, and composition is just vertical juxtaposition, tensor product is um, horizontal juxtaposition, and the diagrams lead from bottom to top. So if you have f from v1 to v2 and g from v2 to v3, then you write f followed by g like this, you know, v1 goes in and then uh, v2 comes out and then it goes into g and you get something from v1 to v3. So that's f composed with g. Um, and the tensor product you write like this, so you've got something from v1 to v2, something from v2 to v3, you put them kind of next to each other and you get the tensor product from, from v1 tensor v2 to v2 tensor, v2 tensor, tensor v3. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, so, so I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't go over it too much. Uh, and we have these cups and caps, this duality, so uh, if you've got Hilbert space v, let i be some orthonormal basis, and you have this kind of unnormalized version of the maximally entangled state, uh, and we identify the state. So, so this is a state of V tensor V, right? But states just correspond to linear maps and the complex numbers. You just forgot where you take one. Uh, and so this gives us these linear maps called the cup and cap. Uh, so you've got a linear map into, into V tensor V and a linear map from V tensor V to C. Uh, we don't draw the one-dimensional Hilbert space, um, which is why these go from nothing to something. Uh, Okay, so so so, um, and we represent the transpose uh, dagger and complex conjugate by rearranging the box. So uh, you have the box for f, and and the dagger is flipped uh, in a vertical axis. The transpose is sort of like a one eighty degree rotation, and um, the the complex conjugate is flipped in this in this vertical axis here. Uh, and then you get these kind of nice diagrammatic equations. You know, you have these snake equations here, and um, the, the boxes pull around the wires as you'd expect. You can sort of pull them, pull them around. So, so yeah, you have this nice kind of diagrammatic calculus. So we're going to generalize this to sort of index families of linear maps. And we're going to do this by shading the regions of the diagrams. Uh, so the shaded regions now correspond to index sets. Uh, the wires correspond, are going to correspond to families of Hilbert spaces, we'll call them one morphisms, and the, the boxes are going to correspond to families of linear maps. Um, so here, here's an example. Let, let M and M be two index sets. Uh, we say, so, so M is kind of the number of elements of the index set. We, we shade regions corresponding to M with wavy lines and, and regions corresponding to N with polka dots. Uh, and uh, the following wire is uh, an M times N index family of Hilbert spaces. So, so you've, got, you've, got, you've got M on the left there and N on the right. So, so it's an M, M, M by N uh, family of Hilbert spaces. And, and we, write, uh, we write V from M to N, which just says you know, M is on the left and N is on the right. Um, so here's, here's, here's a box, uh, goes from x tends to y to, 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 to z tends to u, uh, and it has an m region below, an n region on the right, and an m region above. So it's going to be an m times n times m index family of linear maps. So it's going to take uh, xi tends to yij uh, to um, uh, zi tends to uij. So, so basically you just pick a value for each of these index sets here, and that defines one of your linear maps. So i is, 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 is the element of this index set, j is the element of this index set, and k is the uh, element of this index set. Um, so, so, so yeah, you, you get this family of linear maps. Um, and, and then closed regions are going to be summed over. So the open regions correspond to index, indexing the family, but the closed regions are summed over. So, so here you've got an open m region on the bottom and an open n region on the right, and there's a closed uh, m region. So it's going to be m by n indexed. So here's the m and here's the n, and, and this m region is going to be summed over. So, so you've got this. So again, you pick a you pick a value for each of the index sets, and you just sum over the values for this index set. So you've got. So so this is g g g f composed with g i j is going to be this this sum here, this sum of linear maps. So that's how that's how composition works. Uh, again, for any index set, there's an identity wire which is just. Uh, which is just uh, C um, for, for when I equals J and, and, and zero when it's not. Um, 
we we have it we have duality so 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 the dual you just kind of uh it's, it's going to go from it's going to go the other way so you just uh you just pick the same hilbert space uh we have we have cup and cat morphisms uh which go from the identity y to the to, to the to the to the tensor product of the uh one morphism with its dual uh, and they're defined using the cup and cap of the unshaded calculus. Uh, kind of fairly, fairly, fairly easy to do that. Uh, we have we have dimensions. So so now the dimension is going to be a um, is going to be an endomorphism of the uh, identity wire. Um, uh, and it turns out these things are like the endomorphism spaces are C star algebra. So you can take the the positive square root. Um, so 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 this, this, so these things are just like scalar. These these are just numbers. You get a number for each value of the index set. So these are going to be normalizing factors in in, in what's coming up, um, and we're going to find dagger transpose and conjugate sort of component wise, and we get topological equations analogous to the uh, unshaded case, um, just the same as before. Um, great. So now we can we can define time springs theorem, which is what we wanted this calculus for, right? Which is um, uh, so so we know that every finite dimensional C star algebra is isomorphic to a multi matrix algebra. So A is a direct sum of like matrix algebras, and, and each matrix algebra is kind of isomorphic to HI tends to HI because because HI is self-dual, right? Uh, and then we we define a we define a wire like from one to M by with XI equals HI, uh, and then the algebra kind of corresponds to this pair of pants, right? Because because like for each value of the index set, you have HI tends to HI. So 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 this direct sum like uh, this direct sum like this this corresponds to this direct sum here. Uh, and the multiplication and the uh, and the unit of the C star algebra uh, can be expressed like this using the using the duality of the um, of the uh, of, of the two of, 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 of the two category the, the cups and caps we've defined. Um, so so we sort of we, we can split every 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 finite dimensional C star algebra, and then we obtain Stein Spring's theorem, which says uh, if if f is a, a linear map between uh, finite dimensional C star algebras. Then uh, F is 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 uh, is CP uh, precisely when there exists like an environment wire um, with, of the right type and a uh, a dilation box a dilation two morphism uh, such that the following equation holds and this equation should be very familiar to most people here right like it's it's just a CPM construction but it's the two categorical version of the CPM construction I'll, I'll talk about that in a in a moment um, the point is that this works for like for any finite dimensional C star algebra not just for matrix algebras. Um, so so uh uh yeah the the uh so and then like when, when's f going to be trace preserving when's it a channel uh, it's, it's a channel precisely when this thing is is an isometry so so as i said these things these 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 disks here are just normalizing factors um uh, it, it corresponds to a choice of the trace um so 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 you can sort of forget about those uh if 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 you like um uh, it, it it makes it makes this a special Fabinius algebra. I like to have these normalizing factors here. It's, it's kind of just nice. Um, okay, yeah, and and uh, every every CP morphism has a minimal dilation. Um, so so minimal dilation is is the following the following two morphism is invertible, um, uh, and the minimal dilation is unique to a unitary two morphism. So you can identify CP maps with their minimal dilation. So so we have this kind of nice uh, nice nice way of kind of uh, characterizing a CP map. Um, Great, yeah. So, so if you're not familiar with all this, uh, with all this stuff, I think I think most people probably are. But, but these, this is just Krauss maps, right? Like if you if you pick a value of the in, a value of the index set and then a basis for the environment, like Hilbert space, uh, then you just end up with the Krauss maps, like for each value, for each, for each element of the basis. If 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 you're not familiar with this, um, great. Yeah. So, so as I was saying, this is just a CPM construction, uh, and the ordinary CPM construction in Hilbert is going to give you like finite dimensional matrix algebras. But by moving to the category two Hilb, we're able to obtain all Fabinius algebras, finite dimensional CPM algebras by the uh, CPM construction, and this actually holds more generally, like uh, at least in any rigid C star tensor category. So if you've got a group action or something like that, you can still prove all this all this stuff, and that's in in in, in this paper here. Um, yeah, so 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 um, uh, you, you, if anyone's interested in, in talking about this, I'd be I'd be very happy to talk about that. Um, Great. Yeah. So, so this this is really just an application of that. It's just just an application of that of, of that result. So, so so right. So we wanted to characterize when like a channel is entanglement reversible, entanglement invertible. Uh, five minutes. Brilliant. I'll I'll, I'll try and uh, I'll, I'll I'll have to blast through this a little bit, but 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 hopefully I, I can give you some sort of sort of a flavor of the result. Uh, so so we do it in three cases. So so firstly we we suppose that W is like a maximally entangled pure state. 
that's the kind of that's the kind of um, uh, that's the easiest case, uh, and and then we recover something we've seen before. So so um, yeah. So let W be a maximally entangled pure state, and let uh, M be a channel, and let t t tau be a minimal dilation. And then M is entanglement. In, so this is entanglement in invertibility, not just reversibility. It's entanglement invertible with respect to W precisely when the following two morphisms are unitary. Um, so, so here you've got the minimal dilation, just normalized. And here you've got the minimal dilation, but with the, uh, with the legs bent up, uh, with this leg bent up and this leg bent down. So, so this kind of like transposed version also has to be unitary. And this thing is called, it is, this, 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 this idea of like something that's unitary and also transposed unitary it is called, called biunitarity. Uh, and it was originally defined, I think, by drones in the setting of these, these planar algebras. But uh, uh, Vickery realized that it had something to do with teleportation in, in, in dense coding in this higher quantum theory paper. And then, then Reuter and Vickery showed uh, that uh, these biunitaries, uh, many, many quantum structures like, are actually biunitaries of a certain type. So unitary aerobases, uh, Hadamard matrices, quantum Latin squares are all biunitaries. So, so this is quite... Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, so, 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 so we get biunitaries back. Uh, and this also connects us to these, these quantum bijections, uh, which are int introduced in this, in this sort of like uh, uh, mathematical setting. Uh, it, it, because because the, the quantum bijections are precisely sort of things whose minimal dilation is a biunitary. So, so, so we get uh, a quantum channel is entanglement invertible precisely when it's a quantum bijection. And that allows us to use some ideas from, this, from the kind of the work on quantum bijections. So there's this notion of an intertwiner of quantum bijections. So if you've got a, you, you've got a map like this, uh, like you, you've got a map from A tends to be H1 to B and G A tends to be H2 to B. Uh, they're both quantum bijections of the same type. Then you can think of like morphisms between them, which are uh, linear maps from H1 to H2, which kind of pull through the uh, pull through like this. Uh, and and this, cat this two category has a lot of nice structure. This, this is all in this paper. Uh, a compositional approach to quantum functions. Um, uh, and, and these intertwined, as it turns out, will actually be useful in, in, in defining the, uh, in, in generalizing the result to sort of general states. So, so the next thing we go to is pure states of full Schmidt bank. Uh, so any pure, so pure states basically correspond to uh, linear maps from H1 to H2. And we suppose that this map is invertible. In this case, uh, we get these. We get these equations. Uh, it's entanglement reversible with respect to W uh, precisely when these things are isometries. So now we get this kind of bi-isometry uh, thing going on. But but the the point is the duality is so, so. So this is an invertible map. So this thing is a cup of a duality, and this thing is a, or invertible. So this is a cap of a duality. Um, but so so the duality kind of now depends on the on on the state. Uh, but you you get the same kind of bi-isometry thing going on. So. So it's entanglement vertical precisely when these things are isometries. Um, and uh, 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 if it's entanglement vertical, then we know that dim A is less than or equal to dim B. That's not obvious, but in this case, it holds. Uh, they're unitary precisely when dim A equals dim B. In this case, the entanglement left inverse is uniquely defined. Um, and, and it's uh, entanglement invertible precisely when it's a quantum bijection. Um, so it's entanglement invertible with respect to the pure state, in, maximum entangled pure state. Uh, and this linear map here, um, based on the state, is, is an intertwiner. Uh, yeah, and, and then uh, you can generalize this to, to general states as well. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into so, so much detail with that, but you get these, you get these sort of equations. You get these sort of uh, equations here, and, and you also have the DMA is less than or equal to dim B. Um, yeah, so so um, so that that's general states. Uh, so to conclude, we, we we answered the question of when a channel is entanglement reversible, entanglement invertible with respect to a to a given state, uh, and roughly entanglement reversibility corresponds to biisometry of the minimal dilation. Entanglement invertibility corresponds to biunitarity of the minimal dilation. Uh, this was an application of the CPM construction, the two category two help. So so you get kind of a pair, this pair of pants construction for um, uh, general general Cister algebras. Uh, and uh, in a special case of tight teleportation, we recover Werner's classification. It's it's not immediate, but it's it's pretty quick. Um, so 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 this this is kind of a this is kind of a, a generalization of, of of that classification there. Um, great. So so um, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks, Dominic, for the. Thanks, Dominic, for a nice talk. Are there any questions? All right, yeah. So 
I'd like to know, because it feels to me like you've really covered all the different cases you could consider. It's like a full classification. Is there anything left to do? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, well the, the, thing, the thing that kind of, uh, the, the thing, like, if you did it again, uh, the, thing, the thing that I thought, um, that I thought um, uh, could be done is, is uh, yeah, the, 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 these, these things, we've chosen them to be uh, like uh, matrix algebras, like, like for Hilbert space. But I was thinking maybe you could do it for a general finite dimensional C-star algebra there, so so you could make it like even slightly more general, um, and and then then you could you could cover like class, classical states here or, or, or something like that. I think I think the proof techniques would probably work in that case as well. I can't think of any reason why they why they wouldn't. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I mean, if no one has any questions, I'll I'll just, I'll, I'll just keep talking to you. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also surprised to see the two categorical uh, stuff grow. Is this because you're working with general C star algebra? Like if you were to work with just B of H, you could do it sort of the one categorical picture? Yes. I, I, if, if you were just working with B of H, everything that's done in this paper, you could just do with like one, one category. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so, so if, in fact, you could, you could do all this stuff in like a, like a, uh, if, if you imagine you've got like a group action on all your, on all your systems and all your channels have to preserve the group action. Uh, you could you could do you could do um, uh, you could do case one in that setting as well. So so this this uh, this first case uh, where you get um, uh, with respect to the maximum entangled pure state because uh, because that's sort of like a like a cup and a cap. You have that in this in this sort of covariant setting. But the other stuff kind of like it depends on it depends on um, uh, kind, kind of the fact that it, it depends on kind of the structure of two hill in in, in some, some sense. So so. Um, uh, so, 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 yeah, like, like, it, it's true that, like, if, if you don't care about, if, if you don't care about like, general C-star algebras, like, you could just do it in, in, in Hilb, but, um, uh, of course, then you wouldn't get, like, teleportation dense coding, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Thank you very much. Let's, let's thank Dominic again. And if the next speaker can come. Uh, yeah, this is joint work with, uh, with Pablo and, uh, and Chris. Um, Pablo, who's now at, at CQ, but um, used to be at Edinburgh. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, this is about universal properties of, of quantum theory, but I sort of wanted to talk about, well, what are these like, universal properties to begin with? Yeah, so let, let's talk about actually like the kind of universal properties um, that we're going to see uh, in this talk, which is the notion of a categorical completion. So a categorical completion is kind of like uh, category theory, but with wish, wishful thinking. So you have some category C, and you have some property P that you really want your category to have but it doesn't have it. So what do you do? Well, if you're lucky, there is some way that you can take your category and sort of turn it into a category which you know, contains your original category, but has this property, right? But then how do you know that this construction is sort of the best one that you can have? Like, how do you know that this adds just the property that you want and not all sorts of other junk? And that's precisely you know, what a categorical completion is, because it says that for any other category with this property that you care about, which your category um, embeds into via functor, uh, there is sort of a unique way of going from your, um, your completed category into this one. So in a way, this is like the best way that you could add this property to your category. And this is sort of the, uh, the notion of, uh, of universal property or uh, categorical completion that, that we'll talk about in this talk. So why should we care about like these you know, universal properties at all? Well, it could be for two reasons, or more. Uh, but the first one is if you care about quantum foundations. Because in this case, you can really see that this sort of categorical completion sort of really isolate what is the difference between sort of different you know, quantum theories, or really what sets them apart. Um, the other is if you care about, say, program semantics, like semantics of quantum programming languages. Because what these free structures or these completions really provide is that they provide kind of syntactic extensions um, to programming languages, which actually like, turns out to connect very nicely to the theory of computational effects. And really what they do is that they give a form of like modular semantics for, for quantum computation. Um, so what I mean is, let's say you have some sort of programming language with a syntactic category S, and you want to add some new, fe some new feature to this, right? <clears throat> Well, let's say that your programming language takes its semantics via some sort of functor here into some sort of category C. Now, 
if you have a, um, a construction like this, which is universal, what it tells you is that there's essentially a unique way of lifting this semantics into sort of an extended programming language, which has your new feature um, and sort of respects, uh, which respects everything uh, that you want. So this sort of gives you a way of like, you know, extending your programming language sort of step by step by adding one feature at a time. So before I actually go like too much into details about you know, universal properties, I have to mention these two papers because I think this is sort of really what started everything for me. Uh, so this is a paper by, uh, by Ewan Staten um, from Q QPL um, 2018, where they really sort of showed, I think, like the first uh, sort of categorical completion results of this style that I'm familiar with, um, where they showed that Steinspring's dilation theorem actually corresponds to the completion of a monoidal category to what's called an affine monoidal category, which means that you take um, the monoidal unit and make it terminal. Um, they even extended that um, sort of some more to take care of um, rig structure and, um, and go not just to, uh, to matrix algebras, but to C through algebras. Um, so I have to mention these. We'll, we'll get back to them in, um, a little later in the talk. So in this work, um, <clears throat> Basically, what we'll do is that we'll construct, or make a universal construction starting from finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and unit series and going all the way to finite dimensional uh, C structure algebras and completely positive trace non increasing maps. And that's sort of where like, the partiality comes in. Um, and we'll do it in three steps. So, in the first step, we'll complete uh, Hilbert spaces and unit series to um, contractions. This is via uh, something called Helmholtz dilation, and it turns out that this actually precisely corresponds to taking, um, in this case, the I guess the zero-dimensional Hilbert space and making it a zero object um, in this category. Then the next step, um, what we'll do is that we'll complete uh, this uh, this category of contractions to um, the category of Hilbert spaces and CBTN maps. And what we'll do is actually very close to what you and Staden did uh, in the original paper. Um, so they used a variant, uh, or they used Steinspring dilation. In this case, we'll need to use sort of a partial variant of it. And the final case um, is that we'll go from Hilbert spaces, so just matrix algebras, to Caesar algebras um, by splitting measurements. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the general uh, idea. So how does this work? Well, let's start with the category unitary. So this has um, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces as, as objects, or you can think of them as like BFHs, um, and unitaries between them as, uh, as morphisms. And this is a dagger groupoid, okay, um, with sort of direct sum as the, uh, as the plus and tensor product as the times. Now, when we're looking at sort of these um, universal properties, what we're really looking for are categorical uh, differences between the two categories. So uh, in this case, we'll observe that like, one difference between unit series and contractions is that, in fact, the additive unit in contractions is a zero object, whereas in unit series, it's neither initial nor terminal. It doesn't have any of these properties. Okay? So this is really like a candidate for you know, something that could set these two categories apart. And this is sort of strengthened by, um, well, if you sort of dig in the li literature, you might find uh, a result by, by Helmholtz, we're now called Helmholtz dilation, which essentially says that every time you have a contraction, you know, like this, um, you can actually like, express that as a, uh, as a unitary, where you sort of have you know, an ancillary system here, an ancillary system uh, both in the input and the output, but when you forget about those, then, well, you get the, precisely the, the contraction that you started with. Okay, so the idea now is, okay, can we actually like take this and can we, you know, this this idea of Helmholtz dilation, can we sort of categorify it in a way? And and that's precisely what this uh, this LR plus construction does. Okay, so we just take the object of the category below, um, and the morphisms now are well, a morphism from A to B is now an equivalence class. I'm going to talk about what the equivalence is. I have to read the paper for that. Of morphisms from A plus E to B plus G. And that sort of expresses this notion of a Helmholtz dilation of, uh, of a contraction. Now, 
identities are just sort of identities um, below, but with trivial systems on both the input and the output. And to compose, well, the idea is that you sort of need to retain both of the ancillary systems, right? So we compose uh, like this. Now, it turns out that this is actually like a very nice construction on Daggeric categories, but because if you start with a Daggeric category and you throw this construction at it, then what you end up with is actually just another Daggeric category. So, so far, so good. But then what does this actually give us? Well, it actually turns out that thanks to the equivalence relation, which I did not talk about and will not, uh, it actually turns out that, that this, this LR plus of C um, has uh, as a unit of the direct sum, uh, a zero object. So this takes, takes you from a category which does not have a zero object into one which does. And it actually turns out that sort of the inclusion functor from C into, into this construction is actually universal with this property. So in other words, for any other Daggeric category, you know, where the, um, the sum unit is, um, is a zero object, there's sort of a unique way of, of factoring through there. So this is sort of the best way that we can hope to do it um, if we're going to turn the, um, the unit of the sum into, into a zero object. And it even works as intended. So if we throw unitaries at it, we actually get the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and contractions. But actually, and this, this was sort of surprising to us, it turns out that if you sort of do it for the classical stuff as well, so if you start with, say, finite bijections instead, so finite sets and bijections, and you throw that at this construction, then what you end up with is precisely the category of finite sets and partial injective functions. So in a way, this sort of really connects, I guess, like the, the purely quantum thing to the purely classical thing down here. So that's sort of very nice. That's something that, that I, as someone who works with programs and analytics, really likes to see. Okay, so that was the first step. So the second step is going from contractions to, to CBTN maps. And to do that, well, let's just sort of like start by recalling the situation that, you know, what Hugh and Staten did, um, which is the situation from isometries to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and CBTP maps. And what they did was that they used Steinspring dilation. So briefly, what Steinspring dilation uh, says is that whenever you have a CBTP map, Actually, you can see that as, a, um, as an isometry or conjugation by an isometry. Uh, only the problem is that you sort of get a little bit more than you bargain for. You don't just get sort of the output. You also get like some more stuff in this extra ancillary system E. But if we just trace that out, then it's fine. We get, you know, what we wanted. Now, Hugh and Stad, what they did was that they noticed that the trace for density matrix is actually sort of the unique um, CBTP map um, from B of H into, into the tensor unit C, which means that actually um, the tensor unit in this case is terminal, right? So we say that it's an affine model category. And really what they showed is that in, in the case of isometries, um, F hill uh, on CBTP maps is really the affine completion of, of isometry as a, as a monoidal category. So it's sort of the best way of turning isometries um, into one where the, um, the tensor unit is, is terminal. Okay, and the idea is, well, can we sort of do the same thing in the partial case? Well, let's see. So, sort of in summary, this approach is sort of morally correct, but technically it doesn't work, okay? And there's sort of a very, uh, very stupid reason why. What of them is that if you look at, say, the zero-dimensional Hilbert space, then actually this is zero, zero object in this category to begin with, right? Um, so this is actually a terminal object, so sort of make another object terminal doesn't really seem like, seem like a good idea. But really, like, what's going on is not actually the trace, you know, is no, no longer actually the unique map from, you know, the matrix algebra into the, uh, into the tensor, tensor unit C. Um, but it is sort of the unique total map, or in this case, like the unique trace preserving map. And then actually, like, what about Steinspring? So we know that Steinspring works sort of in the total case, like from isometries to CBTP maps. But sort of what about like in the partial case from, say, contractions to CBTN maps? Is there something we can do there? And it turns out that the answer is yes, it actually just works. 
Um, so we have this theorem in the paper purely because I couldn't find it anywhere else. So I'm sure someone else has proven this before because it seems very obvious, but I haven't been able to find sort of a reference for this. So if you know any, please let me know. Fine? No, okay. okay. Um, but basically, it works exactly uh, as it does sort of in, in the total case. Uh, so whenever you have a CBTN map, you can sort of dilate that to a contraction. In that case, you also get an ancillary system, but if you trace that out, it's fine. Now, in this case, we sort of need to be a bit careful with saying, you know, what it means for uh, a dilation to be essentially unique. Um, because, well, for isometries, it's sort of simple where Okay, they're sort of unique up to isometries applied on the answer alone. Here, they're not going to be unique up to contractions applied to the answer alone, but they will be unique up to isometry applied on it. So we'll sort of need like a categorical notion of isometry in the category of, uh, of contractions. But it turns out that actually this is pretty straightforward because in contractions, uh, the isometries are characterized precisely as the dagger monics, right? So can we use this? like to actually like make a construction that uh, that works in this case and the answer is well yes okay so what we'll do is that sort of given some dagger model category we'll define a new category which i'll call lt times of c which again has as objects just the objects below and morphisms from h to k now or equivalence classes of morphisms you know from h h to k times e where e is this ancillary system and then, you know, composition, okay, to compose, we sort of need to remember like both ends of the systems. Now, it turns out that, well, if you do this to, um, to, the, uh, to the contractions, then with this equivalence, which respects not just contractions, but in fact, the isometries, then it turns out that actually what you get is precisely finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and CBTN maps, which was precisely what we wanted. Now, this construction you can show is universal um, in, a, in a sense that it makes sort of the multiplicative, the multiplicative unit uh, terminal, not for all maps, but for the total ones. In this case, these are the dagger harmonics. But it actually, it also has sort of a more interesting property. I would call this more of a semantic property, uh, which is as a pushout of modal categories. So this is what we call the generalized Pablo pushout. Um, why do we call it that? Well, because it's an instance of the more specific Pablo pushout. But what it is, is, OK, so we start with our category C here. Then we say, OK, we can just take the subcategory of dagger monics and that. Then if we take the subcategory of dagger monics, which for contractions is isometries, then we make the, um, the monoidal unit uh, terminal, right, which is what's going on here. And then you know, we take the push out of that. It turns out that that's precisely this construction here. So the reason why this is interesting is pre precisely because it means that in this case, we get this nice um, push out square where you, know, you have that the push out of the um, inclusion of isometries in contractions and in um, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and CBT TP maps is precisely finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and CBTN maps. So it's called the Pablo pushout because Pablo suggested this. Okay, so we're almost done. We just need to go from matrix algebras to c star algebras, finite dimensional c star algebras. Okay, so and again, we're sort of looking for differences in the categories. Right, this is sort of the general strategy, and basically, it'll turn out that the difference between the two is that in c star algebras, measurements split and of matrix algebras, they don't. Okay, so what do you mean by that? Well, let's consider some measurement in, uh, in matrix algebras, so find the Milton Hilbert space in CBTN maps. So what's that? Well, it's some sort of idempotent on some space, you know, H plus K, which, you know, kills sort of the off-diagonal block matrices. Right? Now, in c algebras, this idempotent is split, right, because you can sort of well, you can do this in sort of two stages, two stages, right? Where first you, you know, you map like your block matrix here to just the pair of, uh, of the matrices AD. And then after that, you sort of prepare that into, um, into a block diagonal matrix. 
So, in other words, like all of these measurements in, um, in Caesar algebra, algebra is actually split in this way, but in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, they don't. Okay? And this will actually turn out to be a defining feature of, uh, of Caesar algebra. So, okay, so how do we show that? Well, we know that you know, finite dimensional Caesar algebra are just direct sums of B of H's, right? Whereas finite dimensional Hilbert spaces just has B of H's as objects, right? So that's really the difference between the two. And now we actually make the observation that every time we have a finite dimensional Caesar algebra, we can actually come up with a finite dimensional Hilbert space and a measurement on it such that the image of that measurement is precisely the Caesar, al Caesar algebra that we wanted. Right? So the idea is you know, to encode Caesar algebras as a pair of Hilbert space and a measurement on it. Right? And the idea is then that, well, these, the Caesar algebra that this corresponds to is precisely the image of this measurement. But then what are like, the maps between them? Well, they're sort of the maps which respect Caesar algebra stru structure. Right? Uh, what that means is, well, if I do the measurement here, and then I do my map, and then I do the measurement again, then that's the same as not doing, you know, just, just doing my, um, my map F, right? But this is precise of the Karubi envelope, so sort of the free splitting of, um, of idempotence, not in this case of arbitrary idempotence, but just for like the measurement item. So this gives us sort of the third uh, construction of the day, which we, which we call split M. So I write you know, that we start with symmetric nodal category star. Um, it's a little more subtle than that, okay? Check the details in the paper. Uh, but basically what we'll need to do is that we'll sort of need to come up with a way to sort of categorically define what a measurement is. We do that in the paper, but it sort of gets a bit tricky. Um, so for now, Okay, we just say that it's like an arbitrary symmetric model category. We define a new one, split M, right? Which has as objects pairs of an object um, below and a measurement, whatever that means, uh, on that object. And morphisms, as we noted before, are sort of the, uh, the maps from the category below which respects these, uh, these measurements. Uh, identities are, well, they're measurements now, and composition is, is S and C. Now, the, um, it's sort of well known that, that the splitting of, of item components, like the Karubi envelope, is a free uh, construction, and it's sort of the, um, I guess, like, sort of the least category which, in which all of these measurements split. Right? And we can actually show, then, that if we, if we take finite dimensional Hilbert space and CBT and maps, and we split all of the measurements there, what we get are precisely finite dimensional Caesar algebras and CBT and maps. Okay, so why should we care about all of that? Well, universal properties isolate sort of precise features, um, uh, which set like, you know, different quantum theories apart, um, but also universal constructions, so these like very specific constructions can actually help you in sort of providing like mechanical extensions to programming languages, right? Now, before I leave you, I've made some memes, as I always do. So here is Macron reacting to the various categories in this talk. <laughs> here is, well, this is sort of like <laughs> everything we've done summed up. And this is what I'm actually doing. OK, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Hey, thanks, that was really nice. I think it's a great uh, program. Um, just, well, I've got a few things, but maybe on the last point about the, the splitting, mm -hmm. I know you didn't say what you, how you define measurements. Um, but yeah, I think you can do this by just splitting the, you know, the causal idempotence in this category, the trace uh, preserving, I guess, met idempotence. Um. Uh, yeah, so here it's sort of, well, what we're doing is basically that we're using like the structure gained from applying like the, the, um, the constructions before to sort of find what a measurement is. Yeah. Um, and 
But what, what you're saying is that you, we could actually do it much simpler? Potentially, depending on what okay. your definition of measurement is. But yeah, we can talk about it. Okay, but yeah. that sounds very interesting. Like if you have an idea of to, you know, how, how to improve this, because this is sort of like the most messy part of this construction at the moment. So okay. like... Uh, yeah, something um, from a, I talked about an earlier QPL with um, Bob Kirker and John Selby. Okay. Um, so it's called, yeah, I talked about it. It's called Two Roads to Classicality. Yeah, I've got more, but I know. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe we'll come back to you. Thoughts on Hi, so, so actually I think Cole Comfort should be asking this question, but I don't think he's here unless he's somehow out of, out of sight up there. Um, so the, the, um, the first construction going from uh, unitaries to contractions, mm -hmm. or in the classical case it was going from bijections to partial injections. Yes. Uh, this reminded me some, of some stuff that, that Cole and, and maybe some of the other uh, Canadians did a few years ago where... where um, where they would sort of freely add units and co-units, which were basically these zero maps. Uh, yes. And in the case of bijections, they would get partial injections. Oh, right. This is for Frobenius algebras, right? Uh, this was, uh, I mean, the yeah, the context was sort of composing props and and this sort of this sort of stuff. Um, uh, d doing sort of uh, distributive laws for categories and so on. Um, it's just had kind of a similar flavor yeah, to this. No, but had, you, there, there definitely are connections. So uh, I've talked to Cole about I'll talk to Cole yeah, about this before, mm -hmm. and there are like very strong connections between his construction of I think adding a co-unit to a Frobenius algebra, and basically constructions like um, like this one where we're sort of like freely making um, like a tensor unit terminal. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's it's sort of the same thing, mm -hmm. but in sort of in Cole's picture, everything is doubled, right? So the thing that you're adding is well, it's kind of like a um, a cap where the thing here is is more like well, everything's not doubled, so we're sort of just adding way to throw throw away stuff. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if that made sense. Oh. But, <laughs> but uh, maybe let's do one more quick question while Stefano sets up his laptop. Right. Are there any more quick questions? No, Sean had one. Yeah. Hi again. <laughs> um, I just wanted if you wanted to say something about the the. I think probably in the first step you were talking about things being uh, essentially unique, right? And I guess you didn't want to go into the definition of that or, yes. or, or the definition of the equivalence classes. So I guess they, those two things go together or something. But is there any? Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there any subtleties there in how you get equivalence classes out? Because the uh, is this essential uniqueness is the one where there is a unitary, but it's not unique normally, right? Is it? So, I mean, you're talking about this Helmholtz relation step, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so basically what we're actually doing is that we're doing uh, exactly this construction, um, but well, or rather actually like exactly the sort of the simpler one where we're, um, it's not just sort of dagger monics that we're considering to mediate, but just arbitrary maps. Um, but we're doing sort of both that construction and its dual. That's why it's called the LR, because we're sort of doing for first L and then R, or sort of the other way around. Um, but in this case, we're doing it on the, um, I guess, the direct sum instead of the uh, monoidal product. And sort of, well, it's sort of in general construction of turning, say, a tensor unit either initial or terminal. In this case, you have to make it zero, so you sort of need to do both. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically just that. Then, you know, it turns out that that can be a little bit sort of difficult to work with, but uh, when you're doing sort of both constructions at once, you can simplify the steps slightly, and that's sort of what we're doing. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yes, this is a short talk about a result that is expected. So not exciting in the sense that uh, there's nothing new in CPM of a field, but good, because that's pretty much what everybody assumed. And so what's the question, really? Uh, it is a cornerstone result of uh, categorical mechanics that a special symmetric dagger for algebras in a field, so just uh, C-linear maps, are exactly the fundamental sister algebras. 
This is this 2008 uh, paper by Jamie Vickery that sort of proved the result in fullness. And we've been, you know, uh, working with this ever since. But of course, the main, the real realm where quantum computation takes place is CPM of a field. It's CP maps, measurements, maybe even CP star. So a legitimate question to ask, and question that was indeed asked shortly after, is what are these structures, these special symmetric Duggar for Venus algebras, in CP maps? Are they exactly the ones that come from a field? Are they not the ones that come from a field? So it is certainly the case that if I take one of these algebras from a field and I double it, so I kill a global phase, I get uh, an algebra in CV maps. It's just the diagrammatic equations transfer up. They transfer up by doubling. And this was observed in 2012 by uh, Chris Oynen and Sergio Boscio. What they couldn't quite prove is that these are the only special symmetric Duggar for Venus algebras in CV maps. So you can definitely get these, but maybe there are some other algebras that give some different notions of copyability or some different notions of observable. So it's not entirely clear that these are just uh, the usual ones. And indeed, uh, it was proposed as a possible way of generating new ones that you could take an arbitrary basis or the normal basis of matrices and you could try copying that basis. Well, this map is positive. Uh, actually, yeah, this map is positive, but it is not necessarily completely positive. And so a natural question is, when are these copy maps for general matrix basis completely positive? And the conjecture was that these are exactly the copy maps for the orthonormal basis of a field. So just the only, the only instances where this map is completely positive are the ones where the matrices factor, the rank one. And these, this problem was uh, phrased 11 years ago. And uh, to be fair, we've not really known the answer until roughly now. And that's what this paper is about. So the answer to the question is, no, there's nothing, nothing new. TLDR, nothing exciting. Uh, but the proof that there's nothing exciting uses a technique from quantum information and quantum foundations that turns out to be useful for diagrammatic reasoning. So I think that's, that's the interesting thing for this talk, really. Uh, there is a sequence of three results, really, that lead us to conclude that there's nothing exciting in CP maps. Uh, the first one is uh, a rediscovery, I guess, of a result about isometries in CP maps. Every isometry of CP maps is actually just a sum of orthogonal isometries with coefficients that sum to one squared. So if you take, it is sum of QI, VI, each VI is an isometry, they have orthogonal images and the coefficients squared sum to one. So this, is, this result was known, although I can't find the original paper where it is explicitly cited. I remember seeing it, but I asked around and people can't really remember who wrote it, but I'm pretty sure that it was stated exactly as, as this result. But nonetheless, there's a nice diagrammatic proof of this. And from that, we move to algebras. Algebras are in particular monoids. Well, monoids or comonoids, it doesn't really matter. It's a dagger category. And these are commodities of CP maps. So you should draw them with potentially a discarding there. We do not know that the co-multiplication is pure. We do not know that the co-unit is pure. And in fact, that's the entire game. Proving that under some additional assumptions, of course, not all commodities uh, in CV maps are pure. That's not true. But it is possible that under some additional assumptions, we can prove that they are. And indeed, if we impose the snake equations and we impose the isometry condition, we obtain a special cases, uh, the special symmetric Duggar for Venus algebras, and we can prove that both the co-multiplication and the unit and the co-unit and the multiplication are pure. So we end up with something which is uh, a doubling of something in a field, and now there's going to be one more complication. The isometry part allows us to decompose our maps as a sum of these orthogonal isometries, and then using the uh, using the snake equations and some tricks with traces and some equalities that you can get that way, you can actually prove that uh, these things are necessarily pure. But that's not quite the end, because what we've proven is that they're the doubling of some maps from a field that satisfy associativity and symmetry and unitality and the snake equations up to phase. So that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that all of these equations then have to hold without the phase, 
but it's a, it's a nice exercise to prove that indeed all of these phases vanish because you can use each, each property in turn to cancel out the phase of the next one. So you start with the co-unit laws and then you move on to associativity, symmetry, and you just make sure that you equate things left and right and then there's this phase that has to be one. So once you have that these are equal up to phase, then these are actually doubling of special symmetric diagram for Venus algebras in a field, and that means that they're all canonical. There is nothing new in CP maps. How is this proven? What is the what is the key observation? It's purity. So purity is a physical principle that states that if you have an equality between a CP map and a pure CP map, then the only way this equality can hold is if the discarded input and output factor away. So your map, the discardings cannot touch the part that remains of your map. So it is, an, it is something, it's a proof tool that can be applied when you have equations that have some generic CV map on the left and some pure CV map on the right, let's say. So it, these kind of equations are subject to purity and maybe you can get something interesting out of it. And indeed, there's an example in the first result, this isometry result. We have an equation that says that a CP map composed with its adjoint on the left, it is something generic, there's some discarding, is equal to the identity, which is pure. And so we can turn this and remove the discardings and transform it into what is just a doubled F-field equation. And we can apply ordinary reasoning from F-field, so ordinary diagrammatic reasoning, as long as we remember that we're working up to some global phase. So this is just reasoning with double maps, but a lot of... Uh, a lot of useful techniques apply. And indeed, we can, for example, say whatever that map is that appears on the right, uh, we can diagonalize it. We can pick a basis for it, an orthonormal basis, um, and we can get these matrix elements. And then we can use that basis to express our, our CP map, the isometry that we had, in just as a sum of some other maps, which are now pure. And now these other maps we can manipulate as maps of a field up to global phase. And we can easily prove that these things are orthogonal, that they are isometries, and then that the coefficients square must sum to one. But just by reasoning in a field now. So we forget about the discarding. We don't need to deal with the, uh, the complexities of CV maps. We just move to a field up to phase, uh, which is useful. And indeed, there are more examples of such equations that contribute to this overall proof, because the unit laws are examples. Some CV map on the left, identity pure on the right. Uh, both unit laws, the snake equations are an example. Some CV map on the left, identity on the right again. It doesn't need to be the identity, to be fair, it can be any pure map, but uh, uh, the entire proof effectively goes through the observation that there is enough of these equations between arbitrary CV maps and pure CV maps that we can simplify everything and move to a field and then reason there where the result is relatively straightforward. So in particular, this answers the uh, question, how many of these copy maps are there? Which ones are completely positive? Well, I mean, kind of unsurprisingly, the answer is only the ones that copy orthonormal basis. But nonetheless, it's something that a lot of people thought was folklore or true. And uh, well, it is true. So at least now we know that. That's good. I think it was a fairly short talk. Uh, hopefully, it was an interesting technique. It's a bit weird, but uh, still quite powerful. Thank you. All right, thanks, Stefano. Are there any questions? A non serious question to give people some more time to think of a better one. What does Ophidian mean? <laughs> that satisfies the snake equations. Thank you. Okay, quite, uh, slightly serious, more serious question, but still not super serious. What made you want to answer an 11-year-old math overflow post? And, and was that the reason that you tried to do this? Well, to be fair, it's, uh, I think it's Jamie's fault. Uh, at some point, many years ago, when I was a PhD student, he, he came to me and said, oh, there's this problem. Oh, it would be interesting. What do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, 11 years later and like... <laughs> Ten proof attempts later, I think <laughs> I just wanted to get it done. But uh, you just wanted that green check mark. I wanted a green check. 
That is the reality. And that is the second answer I gave. The first one was wrong. <laughs> I deleted it. It's not there anymore, but it was wrong. It was incorrect. Um, so yeah, it's, it was fun. Uh, and an interesting question. For a long time, I hoped that, that there would be some interesting notions of mixed only observables that would come out of this. Because it seems the crucial proof technique is this, is this like um, purity with discarding, that's still pure, that it is, which is known, has already been known for many years. I know it's in, in, the, in, yeah. in the Dodo book. Um, so essentially it was just, was just a realization like, oh, this is, the, this is the way to do it. And then it just like popped out, I imagine. Right? Yeah, effectively. Yeah. yeah, it's just the realization that, the, that purity gives you these equations that are a lot easier to deal with than the CP equations that you start with. Tr trying to reason with CP maps doesn't give you a lot of a lot of the tools that you have with linear maps like diagonalizing them is not as nice and uh... so is this is it possible to generalize this to any like if, if, if you challenge a cpm construction um, and if you have a characterization of um, the, the fabian algebra on the underlying category can you then characterize them that it has to be the same in the cpm construction um if they satisfy yeah probably probably that should be that should be the case because nice. it doesn't really rely it uses positivity of the of the scalars. Uh, it, no, it, you, it has to have the purity principle. That's for that's for sure. I mean, that's the main proof tool. But there's some additional requirements. It certainly uses positivity to prove that uh, some if things sum to one and their squares sum to one, then yeah. So, Any other questions? All right. So let's thank Stefano again for the. Last talk in this session, we have Mirte van der Eyden, who will uh, give a talk about hay loss and undecidability of tensor stable positive maps. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you about this project that I did with, uh, together with Gemma de las Cuevas and Tim Netzer, both also in Innsbruck, uh, about hay loss and undecidability of tensor stable positive maps. Uh, and I will talk to you. Yeah about two open problems. Uh, and the first of these open problems is uh, a purely math problem. And it's about taking tensor powers of positive maps. Uh, and I'll explain to you more in detail what this is. Uh, but the reason that we're actually, or the motivation to work on this math problem comes from a problem in quantum information, which is the uh, problem of the distillation of entanglement. Uh, so a lot of you probably know what this is, but entanglement distillation is the idea of having a lot of uh, mixed noisy states and distilling out of them uh, with local quantum operations at least one copy of a maximally entangled state, which is something that we want for many, many reasons. It's a strong resource. Uh, and the link between these two open problems was set in this um, really nice paper by Alexander Muller Hermes and, and collaborators a couple of years ago already. Um, yeah, and I will talk to you about, um, mostly I will explain to you in more detail this math problem and um, uh, present two approaches that we had in attempting to solve these problems. I can already tell them they're still open, like the, the main problems as I will present them, but we have some sort of either partial results or different results that came from, from these approaches that I will present. So um, we're talking here about positive linear maps so um, we will consider linear maps from matrices to matrices. They can have either different dimensions or the same, square matrices only, so uh, dimension D1 by D1. Uh, and such a ma map is positive if it maps a positive semi-definite input always to a positive semi-definite output. That's a positive map. Um, and we can look at the set of all these positive maps. I denote that just by like bigger equal to zero. Um, and we can see what happens if we start taking tensor products of, of the same map. And if we look at P tensor P and check, is this again a positive map? This will be true for, for some of the positive maps, but not for all of them. So we have some subset. And we can see, okay, what if we take three tensor powers? It's again a bit less. And we can go on and on and on. And we can ask the question, are there actually some positive maps that will always stay positive for all tensor powers if N goes to infinity. Uh, and this is true. There are some examples uh, that are sort of lying here in the middle. They're tensor stable positive, as, as this is called. Um, and first of all, this is the set of completely positive maps. It's, it's not hard to see. You can check that it will always stay positive. Uh, and moreover, there's also the set of co-completely positive maps, which is uh, just completely positive maps uh, together with transposition, uh, composed with trans transposition. So this is also 
uh, this will always stay positive. But it is not clear, how, clear however, so uh, by the way, we will call these sort of the trivial maps, the, the trivial examples of, of tensor stable positive maps. And the question is, are there any more? Uh, so are there non-trivial tensor stable positive maps? Uh, this is the question. And if they exist, if we find some non-trivial tensor stable positive map, even if it's only one, this implies existence of an NPT bound entangled state. So what this is, this is in the, um, the problem of, of, or in entanglement distillation, th the question is still open, what quantum states exactly are distillable and what, which quantum states are not. So what we know, if we look at sort of all quantum states, then the separable ones obviously are distillable. You can never distill how many separable states you have. It will never, you can never merge them into one maximally entangled state, of course. Uh, but also states that have a positive partial transpose, PPT states, are not distillable. However, it is not clear if there exist any NPT undistillable or bound entangled states. Uh, this has been an open question for some decades. It was quite sort of, uh, a lot of people worked on this more like 20 years ago or something and they didn't really manage to solve it. And I think not many people work on it anymore, but solving that question would solve this question in, in that direction. And this link again was established by, by Alexander Mullermus. So we had two um, approaches to, uh, to this problem. And the first of that was halos and the hyperreals. So what did we do? Uh, we considered the same question, like normally we always work on complex numbers, right? But we went instead of complex numbers to hyper complex numbers. But let's first see what are the hyperreals. The hyperreals are an extension of the reals um, where more elements exist. Uh, especially, specifically, there exist in extra infinitesimally small elements. Uh, so, like very close to zero, there's again a whole bunch of elements that are smaller than all other real elements around. So, we have infinitesimal elements. And just to give you very quickly an idea of how these sort of how these are constructed, um, so you can construct the hyperreals by looking at infinite sequences of reals with an equivalence relation on them, but that's not so important for now. But for example, just the sequence two, 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 that's like the equivalent of like two. But you can of course have more in this way. So you can, for example, look at the sequence one over n. And this is an example, or the equivalence class of, of this element is an example of an infinitesimally small element because whatever real you can think of, at some point, this sequence will always become smaller and from that point on be smaller forever. Uh, so whatever real you have, this will element, element will be smaller, and this is an infinite decimal element. Uh, of course, therefore, you also have infinite elements, like the, the inverses of these elements. Not so important for us now. Um, but what's nice about the hyperreals is the existence of the transfer principle, uh, which says that all first-order statements on the reals, for, in first-order logic, can be directly transferred to the hyperreals and back, because this is sort of doesn't matter if you state them on the reals or hyperreals, they're, they're still valid. So this is why the hyperreals are sometimes used sort of as sort of a proof technique to sort of, sometimes it's easier to prove something on the hyperreals and you can transfer it back to the reals and then you've sort of made a shortcut. Okay, so from the hyperreals, you can also construct a hypercomplex just by like how you would usually do it, just hyperreal plus i times hyperreal. Um, and what you see now that happens is every normal complex number or has actually a certain halo, this is the actual term, a halo of infinitesimally small elements sitting around it. Um, so if you go from the complex to the hypercomplex, you create sort of this halo of elements around every point. Um, and you can go back, and this is called taking a shadow, where you just basically set all infinitesimals to zero and you collapse back to, to what you had before. So if we consider our problem of tensor stable positivity on the hypercomplex, uh, so we can just define everything like maps from C star to C star and, and, and so on. Um, what actually happens is that all these trivial maps sitting there in the middle, they get a little halo around them. This is like very, like very pictorially. You can like prove this, show it algebraically, but how you can just really imagine it is that, that this sort of starts to glow. And there are elements sitting on the boundary that now glow outside of the boundary. So they glow from the trivial maps into yeah, outside of the trivial maps, but they are still tensor stable positive. And exactly in this way, you can construct examples of tensor stable positive maps on the, of non trivial tensor stable positive maps on the hypercomplex. 
And from this, you can also use that construction from that paper that I already cited, uh, how they can construct from a non-trivial map such an empty bound entangled state. You can do that same construction, and in the same way, um, these sort of PPT states that we already knew to be undistillable, they will also glow outside of their boundary, become NPT states, but stay undistillable. In any case, the same trick um, sort of applies. Uh, and in this way, we can also construct NPT bound entangled hyperquantum states. So be aware, these are quantum states defined over the hypercomplex. So this is not how we usually do quantum mechanics, of course. Um, yeah, so this is sort of, we, we establish this connection. So from these examples, we can uh, construct examples of NPT bound entangled hyperquantum states. And of course, you can Im immediately ask, like, how should we interpret this? What, what, what should we do with this? I mean, it's a nice result, maybe mathematically, but can we interpret this also physically? Well, the first thing we can try to do is to, of course, um, transfer these examples that we found back to the complex numbers, to, to the normal world of quantum mechanics. But of course, by taking the shadow, what you can already see what happens is you, yeah, you just get back to what you had and you kill the infinite decimals and we have like, nothing left from these examples. Um, another thing we could try to use is this transfer principle because we've proven something. We've proven there exist non-trivial um, tensor stable positive maps on the hyperreals or hypercomplex. And this statement we could maybe just as a statement transfer directly. However, this is a, so if it's in first order logic, we can do this. But um, what does it mean to be first order logic? It means you have quantifiers only over the field uh, that you're working on. So in this case, like complex numbers or the reals, or something like that. But our statement that we have says something, there exist non-trivial maps P such that P tensor power N is positive for all N. And this is a quantifier which is not over the field. This is not a statement in first order logic. We cannot transfer this directly back. So, yeah, we, we cannot really say <laughs> anything more than this. I will come a bit back to this later in the conclusion. But I want to quickly also tell you something about the second approach that we had, um, which is we wanted to prove actually that this question is undecidable. So this is like a completely different approach. It's just the same problem, but no hyperreals anymore, like a completely different thing. So instead of asking, um, are there non-trivial tensor stable positive maps, we turned it into a decision problem, which is what you do if you want to prove something is undecidable. So we wanted to sort of think of an algorithm that you could give a map, a description of a map, of a map P, that should output, yes, this is tensor stable positive, or no, it is not. And our hope was to prove that this is actually undecidable, so, so that no such algorithm can exist, that can answer this correctly for every possible input map. Uh, and how you prove that something is undecidable is that you find a reduction from an already a known to be undecidable problem and map it into this. So we had an idea of an, an existing problem that, that we could map into this, what, what we tried. And the reason behind this, that this would be interesting, apart from that undecidability results are quite cool, I think, is that we can actually use this as a proof technique to prove this existence, namely, um, note that it is decidable to um, it's decidable to decide, or I don't know how to say this, uh, if a given map is CP or co-CP. You can decide this. So if only trivial maps would exist, this problem would be decidable. Therefore, if we would prove undecidability, it would mean existence of a non-trivial tensor stable positive maps. It's not constructive, we don't know any example, but it would be uh, a proof of existence, and therefore also a proof of existence of these empty bound entangled quantum states. Uh, that was the goal, so we wanted to prove the decidability of this um, uh, question. And what we managed to prove, like our reduction, we showed that in the end it, it couldn't work from that problem we had in mind, but we proved it on a restricted input set. So we proved that, not like normally it has to be positive on all PSD matrices and send them all again to PSD matrices, but on a restricted input set of so-called matrix multi multiplication tensors, which is just basically a tensor consisting of a bunch of bell states um, going from one side to another. It's, it's not super important. It's, it's like a restricted input set. You can see it like in tensor network language as just bell states in between the neighboring sites. Um, and we were looking then for every n at, at this object, tensor power p to the power tensor n, um, 
with an input of the corresponding Bell uh, states of the correct size. You, you can see it like that. Uh, and we've proven that this question, given a map P, is it positive for all n on this specific input, is undecidable by a reduction from another undecidable problem uh, in tensor network uh, theory. Um, so this question is, is undecidable. So on this restricted input, it is undecidable. Note that this does not exactly immediately mean that the full problem is undecidable. Because of course, indeed, if we input a map P and it is not positive on this input, for sure it's like we can say, no, it's not tensor stable positive. But if it is positive on this input, it could still be that there are some other inputs on which it's not. So there's no direct reduction from this problem to the, uh, yeah, to the original problem that we were trying to solve. So to conclude, um, what we did is we looked at this uh, tensor stable positivity problem on the hyperreals uh, or the hypercomplex, and we've shown existence of non-trivial tensor stable positive maps there, uh, which led to existence of NPT bound entangled hyper quantum states. Uh, and moreover, we have uh, shown undecidability of tensor stable positivity on this restricted uh, input of uh, MAMU tensors or Bell states, however you want it. And there are, of course, so, still some open questions because we didn't actually solve uh, the, the main problem. So there are a lot of things we could do for future work. Um, we still think it is undecidable. Like, it's already undecidable on this restricted input side, uh, set. It sort of has a lot of undecidable feeling to it. Positive maps are just quite mysterious objects or like... Um, so, so it could be. And um, maybe we can find another reduction from another problem. Uh, so if anyone has any ideas uh, to, to try to still prove undecidability. Um, yeah, of course, you can still, uh, like this, this result that we had on the hyper-complex or the hyper-reals, uh, you can debate how reasonable that is um, physically. Um, and we were still trying to solve it in some other ways, like looking at some geometric aspects of positive maps. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mirza. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. That was, that was very interesting. Um, when you say quantum mechanics on the hyperreals, you mean quantum mechanics on the hypercomplex? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, I do. Fine. So, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah. not, not real quantum, not the no, non no. Okay, We're fine. still complex. We're even sort of extra stuff. Is okay. okay. Uh, so actually, it's uh, two questions, really. The part number one, the maps that you managed to find, are they infinitesimally close to a standard positive map. So that's the reason why you can't really bring them down, taking the standard part exactly. and obtaining yeah. counterexamples. Yeah. But do you have ideas on how to perhaps extend this a bit further into the halo? Because that would be something that you can then pull down by transfer theorem again. Yeah. We actually don't really have examples that, that we didn't can say anything about. Like then. Yeah, then the sort of the, the proof that they stay tensor stable positive, that, that's sort of gone. Um, and it's not easy to show that, like, how are you going to show that they are still tensor stable positive then? Because it's an sort of infinite, you need to check infinitely many tensor powers. It, it sort of works because you're, because you're infinitesimally close. Hmm. Uh, because then, yeah, we sort of, we constructed a sequence where we basically subtract this one over n sequence of infinitesimals. And we show that for every n, this one is sort of inside of that. that that's why it works. Yeah. I see. OK. Uh, then, then just a, a brief comment. The, that particular theory, that quantum mechanics that you're, that you're using on the hyperreals, is, has a compact closed category. It has diagrammatic reasoning on it. It has a CPM category. You can do it with string diagrams. So maybe that can help. OK. I mean, this has been known for a while. OK. Thanks. That might be helpful. OK. <laughs> Hey, thank you for the great talk, in particular the hey. pictorial presentation that was, that was really nice to follow. Uh, just out of curiosity, I was wondering, do we know examples of mathematical problems and maybe in particular in, in quantum theory that have been resolved through this hello technique? Mathematical problems where you could pull back and get uh, something, uh, uh, an answer in uh, without the hyperreals eventually? 
I mean, in in sort of mathematics, this this is used uh, in non-standard analysis. It, it, it's called. Um, I don't know about in in quantum theory or in physics or every so. Uh, quantum theory on the hyper-complex has been considered before. Uh, there's one paper, uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you if you want, um, where they use this because you can somehow define... Um, uh, yeah, it, it's in a very different context, but if you have sort of delta function potentials and these things, they're of course normally sort of a bit ill-defined or it's, it's not really clear, but if you use things like this, they become actually sort of just like infinity exists and infinitely small exists as elements of your field so it has been considered in that yeah with that regard but um okay I, thank you for the rest i don't know yeah. uh, I see a question there but i'm gonna abuse my chair powers as a question myself first <laughs> um I have a very hard time imagining like a positive operator that is positive for the first n tensors and then suddenly decides not to be positive. Do you have an example of such? Is there like a sort of a clear one? No, where it's very, it's, it's, no. Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to show indeed that they become not positive anymore, but it's hard to prove that they will still be positive. That, that's a bit the problem. So maybe, um, yeah. Um, so the, I, I really don't know. There are these, these other results um, about finding if a given uh, if a given Hamiltonian on like a, an increasing grid size, if this has like a spectral gap or not, and this is also proven to be undecidable. Yeah. Um, like this feels kind of similar in flavor because there's also like you get like an increasingly bigger sort of quantum system, and somehow there's really complex behavior happening like arbitrarily far into yeah. the dimensional space and. Yeah. We, I, I'm aware of this result, and we've, but we haven't managed to like find a, a map from that, uh, like a reduction from from there. Um, but I agree, it, it's it's similar. Like it's it's hard to imagine what will happen, but something might happen if we prove that it's undecidable. Then apparently something happens. But yeah. Um, thanks. That was a really nice talk. Um, for the for the undecidable um, proof, you said it, you said it was proved by reduction to an undecidable, a known undecidable problem for tensor networks. Um, is this just a, a kind of a tensor net version of a classic kind of a classical undecidability thing, or is it something really uh, unique and kind of technical to tensor nets or something? So the, the the problem where we found the reduction from it's about matrix product states. Um, and the question, like, basically, if you have one tensor and you build a matrix product state out of that by just, like, copying the tensor and making a longer and longer and longer line, will it stay positive? Like, if you started with a positive tensor, will it, it stay, like, a, a positive, like, a state, basically, a positive semi-definite thing? Uh, and this is then again reduced from some uh, matrix mortality or, like, zero in the left upper corner. In, in the end, from the post-correspondence problem, there's always this really this like chain of reductions going on, and that's where it's coming from. Post-correspondence, kind of by the time you get to the end of the chain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, okay, let's do let's do one more question. Um, I, one, it's a basic question, something I didn't quite understand. You said that. Um, you were moving over the hype to the to the hyper reals or hyper complex numbers um and that you would be able to use the transfer principle to kind of regain a result about the regular complex numbers but i thought you said that the transfer principle only works in one direction and that's that statements about the reals oh sorry it works in both directions um the transfer principle it it's like just first order logic you can just like transfer it back on. like up to first order logic the hyper reals and the reals are the same that's a bit the point uh, and i assume you have to strip out any any statement that is saying four numbers like th that is explicitly refers to a a infin infinity or, or an infinitesimal number yeah. in order i mean if you to... have a quantifier over the hyper reals it, it is replaced by a quantifier over the reals okay yeah 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 okay thanks all right let's thank mirta again